The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. For Real Agriculture, I'm Kelvin Hepner, and uh, we're at Crop Connect in Winnipeg. Pleased to be joined by Charles Geddes, weed scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. And Charles, you're leading a research project looking at herbicide-resistant uh, kochia in Western Canada. Certainly a, a growing problem for uh, for producers. Different cultural practices for managing herbicide-resistant kochia. Can you fill us in on what you're looking at and some of the maybe some of the findings that you've things that you've learned so far? Yeah, for sure. So uh, we've, been, we've been working on a, a project that has been funded by the Integrated Crop Agronomy Cluster. Uh, this project has been ongoing for the last five years and there's there's multiple different components to the project, but really the theme is is uh, how can we manage multiple herbicide resistant kochia and what we're finding is that, that many of these cultural tools are quite effective in managing kochia. Uh, when we're talking about cultural weed management, these are essentially, um, these are, are sort of integrating agronomic practices, so things like reducing row spacing, increasing seeding rates, choosing competitive cultivars, designing your crop rotation, right? So um, in this particular project, we, we have some rotational studies. Uh, I talked about a couple of them here today. Uh, one is a four-year uh, wheat canola wheat lentil rotation where we're looking at this rotation um, using herbicide layering, right? So um, trying to apply multiple effective herbicide modes of action throughout the year to manage this, this herbicide-resistant kochia population, right? Um, but we have that same rotation present using either wide or narrow row spacing, so 18-inch versus 9-inch row spacing, or recommended seeding rates versus double the recommended seeding rates throughout the rotation. Um, and what we're finding is that um, across all of the years of the study, uh, talking about kochia biomass, right, um, Across all of the years, all of the crops in this study, if you integrate the narrow row spacings and high, higher seeding rates, we're seeing an 80% reduction in kochia biomass, right? So that just stresses the importance of integrating some of these cultural methods and, and agronomy choices into planning your, your cropping system, right? Um, to put that into perspective, that 80% is similar to the threshold that herbicide regulators use to register a herbicide for control of a specific species, right? So we're seeing control levels similar to a new herbicide mode of action, yeah. right? So that's pretty impressive, actually. So is that what's the baseline that you're comparing to with that 80% uh, common practices, or what, what would your comparison be there? So in the in that particular study, we're comparing uh, that's basically the narrow row spacing, higher seeding rates to the wider row spacing with recommended seeding okay. rates. What can you put some numbers on row spacing, for example? What narrower and and wide might be just to help producers understand their drill setup and how yeah. it might yeah. relate. Yeah, so, so in this particular study, I mean, our wide row is, is arguably quite wide, but it was 18 inches, and our narrow rows were 9 inches. Okay. Um, so in that particular study. For all those crops? For all, for all of those crops, okay. yeah. Um, and so the, the other, uh, another thing that we've been looking at for cultural weed management is looking at the diver diversity of crops in a rotation, right? So um, what I mean by that is, is different crops in the rotation, but also different life cycles of crops in the rotation. Um, so we have one study, just as an example, comparing a range of, su of uh, a four-year rotations that have only summer annuals versus alternating a winter annual and summer annual in the rotation, right? So winter wheat, for example, with a summer annual uh, crop following that, um, or comparing that to perennials as well, right? And so we're seeing excellent uh, efficacy in those rotations that are alternating a winter annual with a summer annual, right? The idea there being winter wheat, for example, is already established in the spring when kochia is just emerging, right? It making giving it a competitive advantage, uh, but then also winter wheat tends to be harvested before kochia produces viable seed, at least um, where we've been researching it across Western Canada, right? So uh, if you can harvest that crop before the kochia produces seed, that decapitates the plants, right? Uh, helping to prevent seed return to the soil seed bank, uh, but also opening up another opportunity for timely management as well. Okay. Getting back to your uh, comparison of uh, the efficacy of, of using these practices versus uh, a new mode of action coming on the market, I guess there's also an economic, you can make the economic argument to uh, increasing your seeding rates and, and using narrow row spacing with that, with that analogy as well. 
Yeah, so, so this, this work, uh, we're coming to the close of, of sort of the, the fifth year of the work and at the very end of it now that we're aggregating all of the data together, we will be doing the economics in, on those rotations as well. Um, so that, that will kind of be coming out in the future. Um, what, I, what I can say to comment on that right now is, is we, um, what I didn't talk about is the, is the yield side of things, right? So um, for comparing just a recommended versus the double the recommended seeding rates, uh, when we did implement the double recommended seeding rates, uh, we didn't see a yield decline anywhere, uh, which is, is sometimes, uh, I get that question a lot about if they're uh, increasing seeding rates, is there going to be more vegetative production than, than yeah. seed production, right? We didn't see that here. If anything, uh, we saw in in the, the wheat or in the cereal uh, part of the rotation, uh, we did see occasional yield increases uh, when we did double those seeding rates. So there might be a bit of a balance there. Uh, helping to pay for some of those higher seeding rates and it does make sense um, to do this especially in crops where your seed cost is a little bit lower right maybe some of those those cereals for example yeah. where did this research take place just for for context i i'm guessing here in manitoba where we have a little bit wetter climate we might have more disease issues with higher tighter row spacing higher plant populations yeah so so this the the studies that i've been talking about have taken place um, either or in Lethbridge, Alberta um, and Scott, Saskatchewan. Uh, we also have a similar study, uh, but with different crops in, in Manitoba as well, looking at uh, like a, including corn, wheat, canola, soybean. Okay. Um, and so that, that particular study, I haven't sort of crunched all of the data on it yet, but, but we are seeing that narrowing up those rows, especially, um, does seem to work quite well in in some of those crops like soybean, for example, where where the question is, do you plant wide or do you plant narrow, right? Yeah. And again, as we see more issues with herbicide resistance in, in kosha, these tools will be, uh, I were, again, the number of tools in the toolbox are not, we're not seeing more, and, and this is an old one that we can, can bring back potentially. Yeah, exam exactly, like so, so these, um, these tools, there's nothing new here per se, right? But what we are showing is that um, integrating some of those old tools um, does work quite well to manage some of these issues that are really showing up across the prairies. Thanks for your time and your expertise again, Charles. Thank you very much.